Letters from A.W. Pink. Letter 11. The State of the Churches. To Lowell Green. Sabbath Day, August 19th, 1994. Beloved for Christ's sake, greetings in the holy and blessed name of the Lord, the one whom the exalted seraphim bow, veil their faces in his ineffable presence and cry, Holy, Holy, Holy. Isaiah 6, and the one we should ever approach with lowliness and reverence. But oh, how little of that holy reverence do we behold in the so-called public worship of the day. Why, even the heathen conduct themselves with more decency and decorum when they pay homage to their false gods. And the more we associate with the whitewashed religionists of this degenerate age, the more shall we be affected and infected with their lightness and levity. One sound apple placed among rotten ones does not impart soundness to them, but causes them all to be corrupted. Your, light, your highly esteemed letter of the twelfth now lies before me. I praise God that he condescended to speak to your heart through what he enabled me to write on June 23rd. I kept no copy. But spiritual meekness is a grace which is of great price in the sight of God. 1 Peter 3.4 it is part of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. We are bidden to seek meekness, Zephaniah 2, 3. If you consult a concordance, you will find that many precious promises are addressed to the meek. Meekness is learned from Christ, Matthew eleven twenty nine. You ask me to write you very definitely about living a life of victory over known sin. You may have observed that I say comparatively little thereon in my writings. First, let me say frankly that I have little patience with most of what has been taught during the past 20 years about the victorious life. Those who have most prominently advocated and propagated it are discredited in the eyes of competent judges, for they are radically unsound on fundamental doctrine. They are Arminians to a man. They deny the absolute sovereignty of God his eternal choice of an elect people, and that Christ bore their sins only. They deny the total depravity of man, for they insist that he possesses a free will and can accept Christ and be saved by a decision of his own, thus directly repudiating God's word as found in John 1.13, 6.44, and 8.36. Romans 9.16 and other passages and where any preacher or teacher is unsound on these basic truths, no confidence must be placed in him on any other subject. If he is all wrong at the foundations, his superstructure is bound to be faulty. Alas, also, real servants of God, sound teachers, have now almost disappeared from the earth. 2 Timothy 4.3 is now fulfilled before our eyes. Men will not endure sound doctrine. They will still tolerate what is called evangelism. They will listen eagerly to a talk on the signs of the times, made up of sensational items called, culled from newspapers with a little scripture ingenuously, ingenuously fitted in to give respectability. They will listen to missionary addresses, but sound doctrine they will not endure. Hence we have in that divine declaration an infallible test by which the poor child of God may measure things in the babble of tongues now going on in Christendom. That test is this. Anything which is endured today in the religious world cannot be sound doctrine. Anything which is approved of, well attended, popular, is not sound doctrine. Where God works, he always does so consistently with his own word. What I mean by this is this. When he raises up, equips, and sends forth one of his servants, that servant will necessarily preach the word and denounce all that is opposed to the word. Hence, his message is bound to be unpopular, in fact, hated by all who are not regenerated. Was it not thus with the Old Testament prophets? Would even the Israelites of their day endure sound doctrine? Would they do so when the Lord Jesus preached it? Would they when the apostles taught it? Would they in the time of Luther and Calvin? 
and poor fallen human nature is the same now. Mark it well, my dear friend, that the people to whom the Old Testament prophets, Christ and the apostles preached, were not irreligious. No, indeed, far from it. They were very religious, but they were determined to have a religion of their own which suited them, and they would not tolerate anything which condemned them. So it is now. Even Orthodox Christendom now has a religion of its own. True, there is quite a little in it which is scriptural, as there was in the case of the Pharisees, and there is in the case of the Romanists. But there is also much that is unscriptural and anti-scriptural. And there is also much that is unscriptural and anti-scriptural, and it is that which proves to one governed by the word that the Holy Spirit is not behind it. The Holy Spirit has commanded, let your women keep silence in the churches, 1 Corinthians 14, 34. Then will the Holy Spirit now prompt testimony meetings and mixed prayer meetings where women are encouraged to speak before men? It would be blasphemy to say so. And yet there are places and groups today who seem to be very much devoted to the Lord, very spiritual, very sound, very much concerned about the salvation of sinners and a separated life for Christians. And these people have their testimony in fellowship meetings. And surely they are not wrong. Test them. God commands us to try or test them. See 1 John 4.1 And observe how Christ command, uh, commended the church at Ephesus for testing, trying those who claim to be apostles. Revelation 2 verse 2 But how are we to test them? Apply the principle of 2 Timothy 4.3 to see if they are teaching sound doctrine. One part of that sound doctrine is the silence of women in the churches. Compare 1 Timothy 2.12 and 13. Read to them 1 Corinthians 14.34 and see if they will endure that. If their hearts are in subjection to God, they will. They will thank you for enlightening them. They will confess and forsake their error. But if their hearts are not in subjection, if in spite of all their seeming sanctity and devotion to the Lord, they are really determined to have their own way, they will quibble, argue, and refuse the light you bring them from God's word. Try it out and see for yourself. Approach them meekly and lovingly. Tell them that 1 Corinthians 14.34 is so plain it cannot be misunderstood, that it is one of the divine commands for us to obey. Take your stand on that verse firmly, and you will not only find that its sound doctrine will not be endured by them, but they will quickly show you you are not wanted by them. As more light is granted you from the word, as you are more regulated by its precepts and commandments, as you form the habit of testing people on religious movements by the word, by which I do not mean sitting in judgment upon them, but measuring them by its sound doctrine, you will more and more discover the truth of that word. He that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow. Ecclesiastes 1.18 Which is something else the flesh does not welcome. Sorrow over the tragic state that poor Christendom has fallen into, and that will bring you into the fellowship of his sufferings. Philippians 3.10 For he wept, not over Egypt or Greece, but over Jerusalem. Yes, it will bring you among the despised but favored company of Ezekiel 9.4. And then, and not till then, will you be likely to cry unto God, O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years, make known, in wrath, remember mercy. Habakkuk 3.2 And while others are running around from one meeting to another, having their good time by fellowship with congenial young people, and while others are lusting after the flesh pots of Egypt, making a god of their belly, and indulging the lust of the flesh, and listening to the radio, laughing and joking with backslidden saints, you will be on your face before God in secret, pleading his promise in Isaiah 59, 19. Oh, that it may please the God of all grace to fit you to become a secret but effectual intercessor, one whose groans and tears have power with God. Such have been my fond hopes concerning others. 
only to have them bitterly disappointed because they were unwilling to mortify the flesh and pay the price. My greatest grief today is that after moving so much from place to place, traveling entirely around the world, I do not know of a single Christian, apart from my dear wife, who gives the slightest real promise of becoming a prevailing intercessor before God. Numbers I had hoped might become so. But my hopes have been dashed to the ground until at times I feel like burying myself in some isolated retreat where I would never meet another Christian on earth again. They are all like those referred to in Ezekiel 33, 31 through 33. They come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show thee much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do not do them. But they do them not. Yes, they will sit at one's feet and admire even searching and solemn teaching, admire the courage and faithfulness of him who gives it out, and say, what a privilege to sit under such a ministry. They will heed some of the teaching and make a general application of it to themselves. But when it comes to detail and putting right particular failings and sins in their own lives, when the shoe pinches their own foot, they refuse to act. They criticize God's servant behind his back and undermine his influence with others. They still cling first to their own favored idols, and yet some of these very persons suppose they can have power with God in intercession. Poor, deceived, and deluded souls. They think they can spend one hour listening to the radio or engaging in light, jocular conversation with others and then retire to their rooms and pray. It is not words which God pays attention to, but heart groans and tears. And no heart can pass from worldly amusements and frothy talking unto spiritual mourning before the thrice holy God. He requires reality, and only His Spirit working in one whom He is not grieved with can produce that reality. Oh, my dear brother, my own soul is weighed down, almost overwhelmed, as I behold the lack of reality in almost all of those to whom I have sought to minister. This is the chief reason why I'm leaving the States. God's blessing has been and now is upon my written ministry in a most unmistakable and gracious way. But my personal ministry, through direct contact, is almost a complete failure. But, as the closing verse of Ezekiel 33 solemnly declares, And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know that a prophet has been among them. And there I must leave it, in the hands of him whom I have earnestly sought amid such personal weakness and failure, to faithfully serve. I rather fear that this letter will be somewhat disappointing to you, but as I sat alone in my room this morning, reviewing the past few years, and then realizing how soon I shall have left the States forever, I hardly felt in the mood for writing a formal letter. As you had so opened your heart to me, I felt like uncovering mine a little to you. None but God knows the sorrow and anguish that my dear wife and I have experienced over some of our best, kindest, and dearest friends. Those who have freely, unselfishly, frequently ministered to us in many ways temporarily, and to whom we so long to be made a real and rich blessing spiritually, not in a merely ordinary general and general way, but to see them actually enter into God's best for them. Perhaps our prayers for them may be answered and our longings for them realized after we are far removed from them all. Forgive me, then, if I have written too freely. At any rate, it will afford you some insight into the inner experiences of a servant of God. The Lord willing, I hope to write you again before the month is out, replying more definitely to several things in your letter. Meanwhile, I enclose one of my booklets on Romans 7. With Christian love and every good wish, I remain by God's abounding mercy.